today we're going to, the name of the message is the return of the prodigal. And as you can see, the image there, which, you know, it took me a while to find, but it's actually a really great image um, of a father running to his son. Anyone that knows anything about any Bible story would have probably at some point heard or read this story of the prodigal. Why don't you turn your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. I'm just going to read the first couple of verses from 11 to 13. And then we'll move on a bit further from there. So Luke chapter 15 verse 11 says this. Then he said, then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them, this is an interesting thing, this is what we picked up a couple of weeks ago, that the father actually gave both sons their inheritance up front. It's really interesting. It's not something that I've ever picked up on before, but a few weeks ago I was looking through this passage and I picked up that he actually gave both his sons their inheritance up front. So he says, he divided to them his livelihood and not many days after, the youngest son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So prodigal living, what does what prodigal mean? Well, prodigal in the dictionary means wasteful or extravagant. So it was wasteful living or extravagant living. So if you know this story, you know the outcome. This young man squanders all of his possessions and is left with nothing. He finds his way back home after much soul searching. His father then welcomes him with open arms and lavishes him with love. That was a spoiler alert for when we read a bit further on. <laughs> so you see that this young man wanted all of his father's inheritance. This is interesting because, now, as we know, inheritances are normally given post-death, yeah. not pre-death. So in effect, this young man was going, look, I... Wish you were dead. Because I want to take your possessions. It sounds horrible, but that's exactly what this young man was about. So just picture this for a moment. Jesus is telling this story to a bunch of Pharisaical leaders. So if you actually look at the, the surroundings of this story, that's what he's doing. So he's, he's talking to Pharisees and scribes. These guys would have constantly agonized Jesus, antagonized Jesus. Always looking for ways to trip him up. So during the latter part of this of his ministry, probably just months before his crucifixion, Jesus was eating with the scribes and the Pharisees. Regard and and he these this, these Pharisees regarded him and his followers as undesirables. Probably Hillary Clinton might you know resemble you know or you know associate with that terminology of undesirables. A few years ago, that's what she called people that didn't vote for her. They were undesirables. <laughs> so we can read that in Luke 15, 1 to 2. So just prior to where we just read before. So simply put, his dining companions were sinners. The religious leaders observing this were highly offended and Jesus would, as would associate with such people. And if you can imagine, like they, they actually came to Jesus and they said, why did you like to his disciple? Why did your master? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus' response was really plain and simple. He said, "This the sick need a doctor, not the not the healthy, not the worthy." So as it, Jesus often did, and what he was so good at doing was he challenged them with a certain parables, and this was just another one of them. So just imagine the looks upon their faces when he explains how his, this father comes rushing down. He sees his son afar off. Comes rushing to his, to his son who completely humiliated him. What you've got to try and understand is back in those days, 
Family and honor was really high on the agenda of, of Jews and of people of those days. If you dishonored your father, you were pretty much cast out of the family and never seen again. So lots of families, you know, I know that, um, see, Matthew would have felt something like this. Matthew, the tax collector. Before he became one of Jesus' followers, he would have been shunned and he would have been completely ostracized from his family. His family would have actually disowned him. More than likely, his father probably would have said to him, I no longer have a son. It was that bad. So when this young man, this prodigal, <coughs> excuse me, said to his father, look, in effect he said, Dad, I prefer you were dead so I could take what's mine. What's mine? <laughs> and his father gave him everything. And when Jesus was telling this story to these Pharisees, you can imagine what the Pharisaical leaders would have been like. They would have been, when Jesus started telling this story, before Jesus explained what the Father really did, they would have been waiting for when this guy turned back that the Father would disown him. So when Jesus tells the story of what a loving Father actually does, they would have been completely completely astonished and perplexed at the idea. You see, we've already established that this young man wanted everything that his father had. But he didn't want to wait for it. He wanted it now. Does it sound familiar? Today, everything is a now thing. Everything has to happen now. Or even yesterday. Now's not even, now's not even enough time. It needs to be it needs to be have done beforehand. Yesterday, everything has to be done quickly. There's no waiting anymore, no patience, no honor. So, was this attitude? Is this attitude exclusive to the prodigal son? I don't think so. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter one for me. But just keep keep your place there in Luke because we're going to come back to it. If we take a look at Paul's letter to the Roman church, we will see how Paul shows us this is how humanity has made the same request of God. We constantly ask for the created without the creator. So Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 22, he says, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Isn't that interesting? And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lusts of their hearts themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Doesn't that sound familiar today? And worshipped, here it is, and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, today, all we hear about today, or, and probably for the last, I don't know, maybe 15 years, is about climate change. Or, used to be, it used to be global warming before they realised that the earth wasn't warming anymore, it was actually cooling. So now it's now climate change. And it's almost to the point that this whole climate debate has become a religion of its own. Yeah. People are, people are worshipping the creature as opposed to the creator. They're more worried about what the planet is going to look like than what the creator of the planet says it's supposed to look. Everything. Look, I'm not saying for one minute that we shouldn't look after our planet. We should. But to worship the, 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 the whole idea of this climate change thing is beyond ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely crazy. To the point where everything stops as a result of what some maybe 16-year-old girl from Sweden or wherever she's from 
starts talking about because she's been told to say a certain number of things. See, most of us don't care too much about having God and a relationship with Him these days. We would, you know, really would just prefer to prefer it if we could just have all His stuff now, all His pleasures. You see, most of us, if we're honest, want just enough Jesus to get the benefits, but not so much that we feel the cost. Interesting statement. So we want the benefits, but we don't want the cost. You see, Jesus gives us everything. He said that we are actually sons of the living God. When we become born again, when we are born again followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are actually sons of the living God. And for you women, sorry, you're sons. <laughs> If I can be a bride, I'm the bride of Christ as a man, yeah. you can be a son. Yeah. Well, I think that's fair enough. <laughs> I think that's fair enough. So the question here is, can the two really be separated? We forgot that it's not God's stuff, but God himself who will satisfy the longings of our hearts. And we've got to hang on to that. We've got to hang on to the fact that the relationship with him is far more important than the physical stuff that he, we want for ourselves. You know, maybe we want a house, or maybe we want a nice fast car or a boat. Maybe we want children because we, can't, we, we haven't had children. Maybe we want a, a wife or a husband. Maybe we want our children back. All these things are all great. <coughs> but if we haven't got a relationship with the living God, all that stuff becomes secondary. So where do you see yourself today? Are you more interested in the creature or the creator? Maybe you're watching at home and, you know, you, maybe you're one of these prodigals. Maybe some time ago you've, you know, you, you, you used to live a life dedicated to God and, and circumstances, your life, for whatever it is, has taken you on a different direction. Well, I've got good news for you today. The Father is waiting. And he's not just waiting, he's running towards you. He wants to wrap his arms around you. And he's saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you, not even to the ends of the world. You know, you, maybe some time ago, you truly, and I mean truly gave your heart to God. And you said, I surrender all to you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Lord. I know that you are... You, you are the Son of God that came to die for my sins. I know that. I, I confess my sin to you, Lord Jesus. I confess it and I, I come to the cross, the foot of the cross, and I say, Lord, forgive me. Take my sin. Take it as, and throw it as far as the east is from the west, as Psalm 103 says. Throw it, Lord, into the sea of forgetfulness and choose to remember it no more, Lord. Maybe that was you. Maybe you said that. Maybe you truly meant it and you're, you were truly born again. But something's happened. Where you've, you know, life's got in the way. Maybe a, maybe a mishap's happened. Maybe a loved one has left. Maybe, maybe you were abused. Maybe, I don't know, just fill in the dots. Whatever the reason is that you've walked away, this man... The loving Father is going to come running back to you. So let's get back to Luke now and read on a little further. So Luke chapter 15 from verse 17. So we're talking about the prodigal son here. And he says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and, and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Isn't that, every time I read that, that absolutely wrenches at my heart. How many people do we know in our own sphere that have done stuff and their, 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 their families have ostracized them and, that, and all that 
Everything inside of them would want to get back in relationship with them. But the guilt and the shame overwhelms them. Look what happens. He says, I, forget, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. <laughs> Here it is. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned. Can you, can you imagine that? Can you imagine? He's this young man who wanted his father dead. He didn't care. All he wanted was his, his inheritance. He just wanted his stuff. Yeah. He went off and, and, he, and he lived that high life. He did everything he could. Lost it all. And comes running back. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. No, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the bed the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son, this my son was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry, they began to sing songs, and, and cheer on, it's never too late, it's never too late, the fatted calf is ready there for each and every one of us. Jesus, our Father, wants us to be in relationship with him. So if you found yourself loving the created more than the creator, it's time to come home. Yeah, yeah. yeah, come on. You know, we've all got family members. I know I do. Loved ones, friends yeah. that have professed the faith, that have, that have walked a journey. And that have unhitched themselves from the Father's caboose. And he's saying, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, the power of the story of the prodigal son lies in the unexpected ending. Those listening to Jesus when he was telling the story knew full well that the younger brother returning to his father deserved to be met with rejection and anger. And yet, the younger brother acted with the utmost disrespect to his father, essentially wishing him dead, as we know, only desiring what he could gain as an inheritance from him. And then on top of everything, he went out and wasted all of his father's wealth. It was bad enough to take someone's money and wish them dead, but then spending all the, on worthless things just added insult in your injury. Imagine standing in that crowd as Jesus is telling this story. And while the younger son was still afar off, the father began running. The Bible says that he actually ran to him. He saw him afar off. That's our Father in heaven. This is what he does. He sees us afar off. When we have the, the slightest glimpse of coming home to him, he runs and chases us. He says, I won't even go into the depths of Sheol to chase you down. That's a loving Father. That's the grace of God right there. No pharisaical, you know, announcement of going, no, he, got what he, he get, should get what he deserves. Listen, if we all got what we deserve, none of us would have a chance in hell. But for God, He loves us eternally. He loves us immensely. You know, those people watching and listening to Jesus' story probably would have listened in horror, wondering how violent the Father's response would have been. Because that's the sort of culture that they were in. That was the sort of culture that they knew. And you know, today... Today is no different. You know, people in this room, a lot of people in this room, have gone through tragic situations. And at some point we've had to forgive someone for a wrong they've committed upon us. And maybe we've committed some wrongs upon other people as well. And we need forgiveness. And you know, some people will turn around and say, listen, you can't, you can't forgive them. You just let them off the hook. And my, my beautiful wife 
once taught me something many years ago. <coughs> we're actually not letting them off the hook. We're taking them off our hook and we're putting them on God's hook. What a, what a freeing revelation that is. It's not ours to carry no more. He says, I will carry it. Give it to me. Give it to me and I will carry it. In John chapter 6, 23, the disciples asked Jesus this question. They said, they said what, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Essentially, all the disciples were, were sitting around begging Jesus for this secret tip on how to be good in good standing with God. You can almost imagine Jesus smiling and leaning in towards them and maybe even drawing it out for a dramatic effect, as, he, as I'm sure he would have done. He was, he was the showman, I'm telling you. Jesus, he knew, how to, he knew how to put on a show. And then answering with utter simplicity, he just said, just believe in me. Yeah. That's the answer. And people say, oh, that might be, that may sound really simplistic, and that's too simple, Simon. Well, it's not simple, Simon. That's <laughs> not. That's not. You know, the reality, the reality is, is that Jesus has made this exceptionally simple. He's gone, come to me, and I will do the rest. Lay it at my feet, and I will take the pain. Like the son returned to his father, we aren't required to clean ourselves up before we come to this. This is the thing. You know, maybe you're, you're at home and, you know, even in this room and you think, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the stuff that I've, I've, I've turned, how I've turned away from God. You don't know. I think God won't accept me the way I am. Well, he does. He accepts you just the way you are. But guess what? He doesn't want you to stay there. He wants to wrap you up. He wants to put the, the cloak of praise and garment of praise over you. He wants to release you of the pain that you've created and, 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 has, and has, has consumed you. Because his love is like a banner. You know, Jesus was a master of communication. Every one of his messages, he knew the audience. He knew what they were thinking. You know, uh, the, you know the story where where Jesus um, that was with the, the, he was in this in this room and he was teaching, and then these people were on the roof, four crazy friends carrying this man who was who was a, a paralytic, four mad people who just had to get to Jesus. And they yell out through him, through this hole, and they, and they lowered this man down through the roof, smashing, taking the, the, the roof tiles off and lowering this man through the roof. Jesus looks up at them. He must have thought, well, what faith these people have got. They'll go to whatever length for their friend. Four crazy, crazy people brought their mate along because they knew all that man needed was a touch from the king. And they lowered him down. And there's Pharisees watching. Jesus says to him, Son, be a good cheer. Your, your sins are forgiven. And then he looks at the Pharisees knowing exactly what they're thinking. And he says, Who is this man? Who speaks heresies? He says, Would it be better for me to go, you know, your sins are forgiven? Or get up, take up your mat and go. And he says to them, So that you know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins on earth. I tell you, son, can you imagine? He's this man has been paralyzed since a child. He's four crazy friends, bring him along, put him down through a roof because they knew that this Jesus was the living Messiah. They lowered him down through this roof. Can you imagine what that young man must have thought looking up 
at this Jesus who says, come on, son, get up, take your mat and go home. And then those pharisaical leaders couldn't handle it because they didn't think that this young man deserved that freedom because he hadn't been clean. And again, maybe that's you. Maybe, you know, you think you're not clean enough. None of us are clean enough. Nothing. The Bible says that all sin separates us from the love of God. All of it. So one sin is enough to separate us from God. But, <laughs> Jesus says, I will take that. Just like Tish had said through communion, there, she said, Jesus had said on the cross, it is finished. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Maybe that's you. Maybe you were the lost. Let's look at Luke chapter 15, verse 25. We'll finish this story up. And it says, Now the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. The older brother was angry. And would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, not my brother, <laughs> yeah. notice that, so as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. You see here in verse 25, we see the older brother confront his father. Upset that his younger brother was being celebrated and walked him home despite his bad decision. You can almost hear the entitlement in his words. That's a, another little thing for today's thing. You know, the entitlement mentality. You know, we all think, we believe, and we all believe that we are owed something in this world. The older brother is essentially saying, I've done everything right. I deserve to be celebrated. I've earned it. And like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, many people have the same entitlement today, I think. But... But Paul boldly reminds us in Romans 3, 23 and 24 that we have all fall short of the glory of God. This is a key concept that the Pharisees and many of us miss our, miss our understanding of Jesus. Jesus says that we've all fallen short. That's why you need me. He said, because I bridge the gap. So Jesus has already done the saving. We don't need to do anything else. He's done it all. So regardless of where you've been or what you've done in, in life, Jesus looks on you with overwhelming love and he wants to do this. Come back. Come back. Come back. Let him comfort you. Let him put the, 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 the robe over you. Let him put the signet ring. You are a son of the living God. And with that comes benefits. It comes benefits. Jesus says, these signs will follow those that believe. There is going to be something unleashed on this earth very soon, I can tell you. The Holy Spirit is, is ready to unleash His power on this earth. In these last days, there is going to be a move of God like you've never seen. Get on board with it. Run to Him. I want you to consider this before we close. One, what are some things you've done in an effort to earn the right to be called a child of God? Just something for you to ponder on. Two, are you currently loving the created more than the Creator? Something for us to think about. And three, do you realize that God loves you so much 
that he would run to you as you return to him. He won't even let you come to him. He's going to be bolting straight towards you and he's going to be kissing on your neck. And do you realize that you don't have to get your life cleaned up before you come home? That's so important. You know, I've so many people over the years I've, I've witnessed to and shared with that say, and they say, listen, there's no way. I've done too much. There's nothing. There's nothing that you could have ever done that Jesus has not paid for. That's right. Everything. He paid for it all. Oh. That means yeah. all. Everything. Incompa encompassing everything. Yeah. All we need to do is just to get on our knees and say, Lord, forgive me. And he goes, done. Just like that. Why don't we close in prayer? And um, look, you know, maybe you're at home and you realize that... Uh, You need a saviour because without Jesus, you are lost. Well, today is your day. Call upon him. Call upon him and recognise that he is Lord and say, Father, I want to come to you. Make me your child. And he will. Why don't we close in prayer? Father, thank you for the story of the prodigal. My prayer right now, Lord God, is there anyone that's watching, anyone that's in this room, that has loved ones that is maybe it's even themselves that that have maybe that you feel like you're the prodigal. Well, Jesus is saying, "Come to me. I love you. I want to wrap my arms around you. I want to get the fatty calf. I want to sing songs of joy to welcome you back home, because that's where you belong." My prayer, Lord God, is for our family members to run, not just to walk back to him, but to run. And that the Father will run and there'll be this union yeah. in the middle of the street, just like this, yeah, this image here yeah. shows. Yeah. So Father, we thank you for your love over us, the, the love and the grace that encompasses everything. And we bless you and we honour you in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, church. We'll see you again next week.